All right, so tonight is all about grooming, um, oral care, ear care, nail trimming, um, and I, I'm, this is definitely my wheelhouse as I had grooming salons for 30 years. So uh, super excited to share some of these tips and tricks. And I use them all like grooming at the shelter. And um, so it's, it's pretty exciting. Okay, so share screen, minimize this, close, recent. Okie dokie. All right, so this is my baby Capone. He loved being a model. Um, and uh, he is gonna help us talk about all of these. So, you know, grooming is not, it's not just a luxury. Um, you know, they our domesticated dogs need grooming. Um, so many times if our dogs have any types of uh, body odors, it could be a sign of cancer, urinary tract infection, parvo, um, bacterial infection, yeast, very, very common. I had two clients today that our conversations were all about yeast um, in their dogs. Um, it could be anal glands, um, uh, it, you know, cer certain types of oily dandruff, which actually can be mites, um, little mites that type of dandruff, infected ears, wet dog odor, that yeasty beastie smell, which is awful, smells like Fritos. Um, all, you know, there's, there's all sorts of skin problems, but when you groom your dog on a regular basis, you're gonna notice these and you're gonna be able to um, address them. So we're gonna just start off with some of the basics. So shampooing our dogs. I am gonna put in the follow-up email, um, you know, in our mini class, it's a little bit difficult to go through every single ingredient that, you know, is in a common shampoo. But um, basically, um, there are so many chemicals and synthetic fragrances that our dogs can be reactive to that are toxic to our dogs. Um, and in many of these shampoos on the market, um, many of those ingredients are actually banned in Europe in other countries because they're carcinogens and they're known to cause cancer. So I personally make all of my own shampoos, even um, going through some of the best of the best shampoos in the market, there's still preservatives, additives, most, most of the time there's fragrances, or they may add an essential oil, but it's not truly 100% of an essential oil. And that particular essential oil could add fillers or synthetics which would be re very, very reactive. Um, my big guy here, Buka, is, uh, has severe skin allergies. He has environmental allergies, food allergies, he has topical allergies. So I'm really cautious with him. So I like to use unscented Castile soap. I buy the unscented baby Dr. Brommers. You can buy it on Amazon, you can buy it at, usually at CVS, even the grocery store. Um, organic apple cider vinegar, uh, which is natural anti, uh, it, it's natural anti-parasitic, antibacterial, antifungal, so it helps with all that. Um, the aloe inner leaf gel, so it'll say right on it, inner leaf gel, very moisturizing, soothing to the skin. I always use filtered water. Um, three drops of lavender, calming, soothing, great for repairing skin, Roman chamomile, great for any itchy squitchies. Myrrh is extremely reparative. Uh, and frankincense is anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral. So this is my kind of everyday um, shampoo blend. Um, I uh, like I said, on the bottom here, um, there's many, many ingredients that are very toxic in, in commercial pet shampoos. And then if you do need a flea and tick shampoo, you can mix it up. So here's some basic flea shampoos, the lavender and lemongrass, if you have ticks in your area. So when I go back to Cape Cod in May and June, um, the ticks are starting to come out in the spring with the moisture. So I will add in some peppermint, geranium, and rosemary. 
Um, and rosemary, by the way, helps stimulate hair growth. So if you have a dog that's uh, struggling um, with any type of hair growth, many times dogs that have thyroid conditions are struggling with hair growth. Rosemary is a great one to add to that. Um, you just mix all the ingredients up and uh, just shampoo as normal. Um, conditioning. So conditioning is, it depends on the dog. If you have a dog that you're really struggling with yeast and an overgrowth, you don't wanna add moisture to that dog skin. So you wanna probably use that first shampoo, the antiseptic shampoo, that's phenomenal. Um, long haired dogs like Bean, the little Pomeranian I had, or if you have a Maltese or Bichon or, or the Doodles, we have so many Doodles right now. Um, adding a conditioner, it not only cuts the shampoo, so you reduce the risk of leaving shampoo or suds on a really coated dog, but it also helps with those mats. It helps slip mats out in those tangles. I don't think I could brush Bean out. She has, you'll see, she has such an incredibly thick coat now. Um, could you, excuse me one second, Buka is eating a shoe. Sorry about that. He's like a toddler. Um, so, uh, you know, I do like to use a conditioner when I condition my dogs. I use the doTERRA conditioner because I know exactly what's in it. I know that it's safe. I know it's been tested for synthetics, pesticides. There's no fragrance in there that is a synthetic fragrance that's going to irritate his skin. Now, the reason I put the little dog down here on the bottom, so a lot of people struggle with the, the goopies that, that dogs get in their eyes and sometimes they get sores under their eyes. Um, like Bella, my Brussels Griffon, she's got this little flat face, she's got long hair on her face. And so sometimes the eye discharge builds up. You can use a very, very diluted uh, conditioner. So I might take, maybe like um, a tablespoon of water, filtered water, and I'll put a pea-sized drop of conditioner in there, mix it up in a little glass bowl. And I use these cotton pads and I just wipe away her eyes. Conditioner is alkaline, it's not acidic. It can't burn or hurt her eyes. So, you know, many times when I'm grooming these dogs in the shelter and they're completely matted, their eyes are, are really a mess there. I'll take that cotton pad with a conditioner, soak it and really work it off with some warm water. And then I use my little flea comb. And because the conditioner is slippery, those eye cookies slip right out. So um, I clean Bella's eyes every morning with that conditioner blend. It keeps everything out of there. She, she's never had any type of eye infection, any type of wrinkle infection. This is great for bulldogs. This is great for Sharpays. Um, and like I said, the long haired dogs. Uh, then some maintenance in between. So like Bean, she's long, she gets staticky, she gets in here in Florida, we got all these crazy little prickers and stickers and everything. So I love to use that leave-in conditioner that we have. Um, I just lift her coat up, do a light mist in there, and then all those little prickers slip right out, keeps her moisturized. And then Buka, he's more on the drier side, a lot of labs and dobies, um, you know, those, those even Frenchies. Um, pugs, they've got that shorter hair. You might have the heat on if you're in a cold area right now. You might have um, uh, forced hot, hot air um, heating system. You might have fireplaces and coal stoves going, and your dogs may be drying out like crazy. So, the root to tip serum, you just put one to two pumps in your hand and then rub it through their coat. And um, as you can see, this is. This is Buka Shine Serum. He's he's absolutely gorgeous. It keeps him um, nice and moisturized. And I really, really love the smell of it. So if a dog is struggling with, um, you know, any type of skin challenge, an Epsom salt soaks are wonderful. Super, super easy. You fill the tub um, and you use, you know, in a regular size tub, you'd use about a cup of Epsom salts. 
Um, but if you're doing it like in the kitchen sink, in the kitchen sink, if I do Bella, I might put a, a quarter of a cup of Epsom salts and then add my essential oils that she's requiring. I do recommend your pro tip is to mix in your essential oils into your Epsom salts first and then put them in the water. They disperse much easier. But here's a couple ideas. So if they're struggling with a little arthritis and it's cold out, a nice Epsom salt soap with frankincense and copaiba is wonderful. Really, really helps soothe those muscles and joints. Itchy skin, lavender and Roman chamomile are my go-tos. Um, if they're stress balls um, and, and really struggling with anxiety, serenity, and balance is fabulous to basil and purify. Great for hives. We did have a little problem where uh, Bella sat in some red ant hill here. So we, we went for our basil and purify that removes the hives and the, the welts almost immediately. Um, lemongrass, lavender for yeast. So a lot of dogs, especially Cocker Spaniels, Springer Spaniels, they struggle with yeast infections, especially in their toes and around their nail beds. So lemongrass and lavender is great. So on guard for overall immune boosting, antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. So then you add the dog, you soak. Um, I recommend about 10 minutes if you can. And then um, you're gonna rinse, uh, lightly rinse them, dry them, brush them, repeat as often as you need. If you're struggling with a, a skin infection, you may need to do it once a day. And then always, 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 always treat them, reward them for a really good job done, for standing in the water, talk to them the whole time. So that way you can get them to stay for about 10 minutes and just really make it a really nice relaxing environment for them. If you are gonna do an Epsom salt soak in your dog, you know, perhaps doesn't like the water, doesn't want to soak, <laughs> which many don't, then you might start with the diffuser 20 to 30 minutes prior with a relaxing blend to help them relax first. Um, but I have really always been able to get rid of rashes and, um, uh, you know, over those overactive sebaceous glands by doing these Epsom salt soaks. Then now that we've washed them, we need to dry them. So air drying, super easy, right? You wash your dog, you just let them be. But the problem with that, if you do have a dog that has any type of moist dermatitis, they can grow fungus between the pads of their feet, their armpits, bulldogs. You should never, ever, ever leave a bulldog or a Sharpay wet. They need to be dried in all those wrinkles. Um, you, um, you know, if, if it's a coated dog, like a doodle, then they could mat up and then, and as the water evaporates, the mats, uh, they're like cotton candy and they suck themselves to the skin. And so then, you know, when you're trying to brush that out, you'd be brushing the skin and you could risk skin irritation. Um, and, you know, labs, goldens, things like that. If they can get outside when they're wet, they're definitely gonna go roll. Um, towels are a great option. So a lot of times people will rub vigorously back and forth. Um, if, it's a, if it's a coated dog, uh, it will mat. I was actually grooming a dog at the shelter and there was a woman she, she wanted to watch and help. And, and she really was being so sweet, but she was rubbing um, this like Wheaton Maltese cotton candy fur dog in like circles. And I had to ask her to stop and pet her flat <laughs> so that we didn't end up with you know, even more mats than we started with. Um, so you want to really almost kind of squeeze the, the water out of them, you know, as if you're using like a chamois to absorb the moisture, but not rubbing in circles. Um, hair dryers, they're great, they're easy, they're quick. Some dogs are, are, are seriously afraid of them. Um, they can also burn a dog easily if you, you know, are really trying to get an area dry and you're not moving it. Um, I've seen so many burns in, in my grooming years. Um, and sometimes it doesn't always get down deep to those double coated dogs. You know, for, for a dog like Bella, who has very, very thin hair and she fluffs easy, you know, I could probably get away with a hairdryer really moving it, but I would keep it on um, low and I would keep it on 
I, I like to circulate room temperature air and not use heat on them because I don't want to dry their skin out. So one of the best dryers for um, a coated dog would be the high velocity dryers. They're adjustable. You can turn them high and low so you can make them super quiet for a dog that's nervous. It helps remove undercoat without you brushing your skin, um, saves time and money. So dry brushing, this is just you brushing at home kind of maintenance stuff, but it does a lot more than just brushing the hair out. Um, you're going to eliminate dead skin scales. You're gonna enhance blood circulation. It actually helps cleanse the, the lymphatic system because you're getting that blood flowing, which is super important. Um, and um, it helps rejuvenate the nervous system. It improves digestion, kidney function, helps relieve stress. All these are great things. This is, um, I've posted a lot of this stuff. Many of you have seen this in my 30 day doggy detox because it's so important to brush your dog. Even a short haired dog, you can use one of those grooming gloves and just to stimulate um, their hair, stimulate their skin cells and their lymphatic system. Great bonding time. It gives you a chance to notice lumps, bumps, any lymph nodes that might be inflamed, any discharge that might be in their ears, um, you know, any mats that might be arising. A lot of times uh, I, I pet Bean behind her ears very often. She likes that, but I'm depositing the oils from my finger in the hair behind her ears. So she develops these tangles. They actually call them love mats because I'm giving her so much love. I'm causing these tangles on her. So I, I have to be very diligent about brushing that area. Um, it removes undercoat. It distributes their natural oils uh, so that they continue to, to produce them on their own, keeps the pores open and draining. So I, I recommend, I brush my dogs. I will be honest, I do not brush my dogs every day, but I do brush my dogs at least three to four times a week. I brush everybody. Um, brushing and combing. So you want to brush a dry dog. You never want to brush a wet dog. Um, it, it the, the tangles just don't come out. You want to brush in layers. And this is what I'm going to show you with Bean um, after we're done. You want to start from the bottom and work your way up to the top. So a dog like her, you can see she's a big fluff ball. She's got this incredible double coat. She's got this short cotton candy fur underneath these long guard hairs. If I just brush the top of it, I would never get that undercoat out. When I first got her, she was like a lamb. If I sheared her, it would have come off all in one giant chunk because she was so matted. Um, you never want to comb a mat out. You always want to go back to the brush and separate that hair because it doesn't hurt them. If you hit it with a comb and pull it, it, it really hurts them and they're not going to like this grooming experience. You want to use the wide part of the comb first and the small. And you wanna concentrate on friction areas. Like I said, I put love mats behind her ears. She tends to get matted under her armpits. She gets matted where her legs are connected to her tummy because of her running. Um, so friction areas are a very common place. These are, and you don't have to have a lot of equipment. These are the three tools that I brought to Florida with me and I'm grooming all these dogs at the shelter. And um, I, I have, the, the wide and the small tooth comb all in one. They call this a greyhound cone, uh, comb. I have this slicker brush. So slicker brushes come in, in many shapes and sizes. This one has long teeth. You can see very, very long teeth here. And it helps me get into that deeper undercoat of hers. And it has a slight bend in it. I highly recommend those for dogs that um, are undercoated and matted uh, or that get matted like doodles. And then this is my little, this is a little slicker, but it's super soft. It's got very, very gentle bristles. I, I could never use it on Bean because her hair is too thick. But for Bella, who's got very, very thin, wispy hair, it's perfect when I, when I um, comb her out. So then ear cleaning. So this is my ear cleaning recipe. You know, a lot of people struggle with dark discharge in their ears. That's usually yeast generally speaking, yellow discharge, most likely a bacterial infection. 
Um, so I make these ear cleaning maintenance pads. There's a lot of ear cleaners on the market and they, the majority of them are alcohol and they sting and they burn um, your pet's ears. And so they, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I get out the ear cleaner and they run It's because it hurts. Um, I love um, this recipe. I make a big batch of it. I use lavender, geranium, frankincense, basil, arborvitae. The reason I use all of these lavender soothing, geranium is incredible for skin repair. And it's also a great bug repellent just in case there were any um, ear mites. Frankincense is antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, and anti-inflammatory. Takes out any, um, you know, any cooties that are going on in there. Basil, like we had said in the Epsom salt slide, is a great antihistamine. So if it is red and inflamed, basil is going to help with that. And then arborvitae, again, amazing for any type of um, pest that may be living there. A little bit of hydrogen peroxide. I fill the mason jar with witch hazel. Witch hazel is soothing, takes away any itch and redness. Then I, um, I shake up the bottle, add some cotton pads, and they're ready for me to wipe out the ears. I clean my dog's ears twice a week. I clean my dog's ears on Wednesday and Sunday. That's our maintenance day. <laughs> um, the only dog that gets uh, well, that used to, I, I had a lab Merck, Booga doesn't swim, but Merck swam every day. So I cleaned his ears with this drying solution every day. So if you have a dog that swims every day, or if you give your dog a bath, you want to use this drying solution after the bath, or if it's raining constantly and your dog is getting, um, you know, rain in their ears, you want to use this uh, drying solution a little bit more often. Otherwise, the ear canal is L-shaped and it can, um, in the bottom of the L is where the eardrum is. So that is where water can get trapped. It is the perfect place for yeast and bacteria to grow because it's warm and dark. Then if you do have a problem, this is an ear treatment oil. So what you would do is clean the ear out, flush any of that, that yuck out of there, but then you're want, gonna want something that's going to be a little more long lasting and treat that oil. You're not gonna drop this oil in their ear. You're going to mix this blend up and it's the same ingredients, except you're using fractionated coconut oil. Um, and you're gonna use this once a week. And what I do is I put a little bit on a cotton ball and I just wipe the inside of the ear. You don't have to have it get down deep. Aromatically, it's gonna get down deep. I do that once a day for seven days um, and kind of see, you know, for a really stubborn, especially yeast infection, you may need to go 10 days. So oral care. Um, this is a biggie. So many dogs are struggling with bad teeth and, um, you know, just a little tr uh, trivia, I guess. Um, each tooth is related to a different meridian in your body. So each tooth, whether it's ours or theirs, is related to a different organ in your body. And so what happened with me is um, Merck pushed Bella off the couch accidentally. She broke her canine um, to the gum line. All of a sudden, she, she started spitting up a little bit. She just really wasn't herself. And I, then I realized that her tooth was broken. And so we brought her in, but I did blood work. And the canines related to kidney, her kidney values were elevated. So I ended up having the rest of the root removed. I went to a doggy dentist and had that done. Her kidney values dropped down to normal. So it was really affecting her. So teeth and oral care is very, very important. So what you can do at home is teeth brushing. And don't feel if you have a dog that has tartar that um, you can't start working on it at home. I couldn't even see Bean's teeth when I got her. There was so much tartar on her teeth. I couldn't see any white. So what we did is we um, started to brush them every day. There's a couple ways to brush them. So a toothbrush like this is fine for a lab or a golden retriever or a bigger dog that um, has a bigger mouth. But for a little Bean, it, much too big. 
even my finger with a finger toothbrush. This is great, again, for a dog that's a little medium size to a little bigger. This is a great way to brush their teeth. For a little itty bitty dog, what I do is I get a package of gauze and I wrap the gauze around my finger and I dip it into my toothpaste and then I rubbed each tooth. So, and with her, because her teeth were so bad, I brushed her teeth every single day. And I use this toothpaste here. There are many doggy toothpaste on the market and they, you know, they're beef flavored or liver flavored and they've got all these um, artificial flavors and sweeteners. That's what we're trying to avoid. So I, I do not recommend them at all. And you definitely do not want to use doTERRA's human toothpaste on our pets because that has xylitol in it and xylitol is toxic to pets. So this toothpaste, so incredibly easy to make. You can make it in about 60 seconds. Um, what you're gonna do is take a glass jar, always glass jar with anything you do with essential oils. I do about one tablespoon of baking soda. Sorry, my typo there. I wrote backing soda. Um, two, one teaspoon of baking soda, excuse me. Two tablespoons of raw coconut oil. That's the hard coconut oil you get in the grocery store, not the fractionated. Um, two drops of the On Guard essential oil and two drops of the lemon essential oil. So On Guard essential oil is going to boost their immune system, but it's also for a dog that does have some gingivitis or periodontal disease um, starting. If you have a dog that has some red gum lines, um, this is going to um, help with uh, any of that bacteria. The lemon is phenomenal for changing the pH of the mouth. Um, and so you're going to brush your teeth. If you see a little bit of bleeding, it's okay. It just means there's a little bit of irritation. You definitely want to brush up in that gum line. Over time, that will subside. So then the second thing that I do is we alkalize their water. So like I said, lemon oil is, I put one drop of lemon oil per two cups of of drinking water. So when I change their water in the morning, I always put one drop of lemon oil. Um, I mix, I shake it, shake it, shake it in like a mason jar and then I pour it in their water bowl. And what, I, what that does is that prevents the plaque from mineralizing and turning into tartar. And so after about two and a half, three weeks, all of a sudden, I could start to see some of Bean's teeth. Like as I was brushing her teeth, I could take my fingernail and crack off some of that tartar. So it was starting to loosen up. And we just worked at it day by day by day. I got rid of all of her tartar. She has no tartar on her teeth. Then we give our dogs raw bone marrow bones. So they get to chew on these. This is a um, great mental stimulation, but it's also a great way for them to scrape their teeth. Um, and I don't uh, recommend greenies. Um, they're choking hazards. They're full of um, all sorts of strange chemicals and you know rubbery substances. They get they cause blockages and obstructions in their digestive tract. Um, so I, you know I always use this is what they were me meant to eat in the wild is bones. And then being on a prey model diet, low carbs. So carbohydrates feed tartar. So dogs that are on a kibble diet or on a high grain diet are dogs that we see a lot, a lot, a lot of tartar in. So feeding them a prey model diet of raw meat, um, you know, and we're, we're going to, our last class is on nutrition. So we'll take a deep dive into that, but we've talked about that quite a bit, some of these classes. And last is nail care. So um, nail trimming and filing, very, very important. Um, I want to just, first of all, explain right here. So here's the nail. Um, and there is a blood supply and nerve supply right here, the pig. This outer area is what we can trim off. So what happens when a dog's nail continues to grow and grow long is the quick grows with it. That's why when you go to the vet and you're like, you know, cut my dog's nail short, they can't cut them back here because the quick is here, the nail supply is here. So what you have to do is, you know, I, my dogs get their nails done every Sunday when I do the ears and the teeth. So every week, once you trim them, 
you see down here, you trim them, the quick recedes. I trim them back further, the quick recedes. So that's how I got Boopa's nails to these little itty bitty nubbies. He came with nails that were curled and went around sideways like this, but just little by little doing them once a week. Um, if you, and once you get them to this point, trimming is um, not necessary at all. I very lightly dremel their nails. Now you may say, oh, there's no way I can even touch my dog's nails. And so what you have to do is set them up for success. Um, and so I use this um, calming blend that we talked about in our emotional class, the serenity, the vetiver, the balance. So I put a drop of one of each of those in my hand. I rub it on his chest. I put a little on the inside of his ears. I have the diffuser going before I, I start any of this grooming. And I will be very honest. I was able to do one foot and that's really all he could handle in the first day. And I treat him and tell him how wonderful he was and, and really, you know, really make it fun for him. But it took a while. He was like, you know, a flopping fish on the floor. He was scared to death to have me touch his feet. So you may not be able to do it all in one sitting, but they will learn. So always reward them, make it fun, go slow. This is a great bonding time for you guys. Try, if, if you have to rush, then don't groom them that day. Just wait and, and move on. Um, I am gonna grab Bean and just do a really quick little demo because I know we're at 7.30, but I just wanna show you how to, how to work with a coated dog. And I wanna show you how to Dremel that nail because I know that sounds a little bit scary too. So give me two, one second. All right, so I figure I would grab, I don't wanna say the bad dog because she's not a bad dog. I would grab the challenging dog. <laughs> the one that just learned how to do all this and put that that way. Um, so when I, when I do groom them, I, um, like I said, I, I always like to set them up for success. I did put a little bit of lavender in her ears a little bit ago, um, right before we started this, this call. I, I have her freeze-dried treats right here. I like little ones. And um, she, and if you have a dog that is food motivated, you can start by giving them a treat and you know, just making it super, super positive experience. Um, so the two, and I'm just going to show you these brushes, the two, so this is long, the long one for the really coated dog. You can see how it has a little bit of a bend in it. And then this is the greyhound cone. Um, so she is just, look at her, she's just a, a giant ball of fluff. And especially back here, what you do is you always, and you want them to be in a, in a natural position. This is what a lot of people do sometimes and they don't realize they're doing is they'll take like a leg and bring it up here and they're like dislocating their hip. And you know, and it's because they can see better they're like this. <laughs> so you really wanna try to be really conscious about having them at the, the most natural position. Um, and so I lift her fur up and then I basically am parting her skin. So I'm just gonna go little by little little by little and work my way up. And I always go in the same order when I'm grooming my dog, especially if you have a wiggly, squiggly dog. So I do hind leg, body, front leg, hind leg, body, front leg, head, and then tail. If I go in the same order each time that way, like, you know, David's walking through, she might wiggle, want to say hi or something. You know, I'm, I, I don't want to lose my place. And so I keep on going up and then I go up, I use the wide part of the comb and then brush through. Now, if I hit a snag, I would stop and go and separate that again and then go back through. And this way she lets me do absolutely everything to her. She's been really, really good. And we haven't, you know, she's only been with us, um, I think now 15 weeks. So it really hasn't been that long considering her, um, where she came from. Um, 
Now, uh, the, the soft one like this, this is a little soft one. So she's got these little tiny ears. And so this one would be too harsh on those ears, right? So I'll, I'll use the soft one up here on her head and because she still gets undercoated on this head, but you always want to go in layers. And the same thing, if I were to do her chest, I would put her this way. And I'd start at the bottom. Yeah, like that, good girl, good girl. Your chest, and if you're starting with a new dog, or if your dog it doesn't like it, then just stop after each section. Treat them. Just make it super, super fun. She's extremely food motivated, so it's good. All right, let me show you the toenails real quick. Now, I like so. There's many different types of toenail trimmers. There's the guillotine kind. I do not like those at all. The reason I don't like them is because they they twist the whole nail inside the nail bed. And for dogs that have arthritis or, or that are sensitive to their feet, you're never gonna be able to treat them. These are like scissor types and they're very, very sharp. These are made by Miller's Forge. I, um, I love these. I love them for big dogs. I love them for little dogs. You know, I probably will put a link in there for you guys just so you have them. I'm not gonna trim her nails because I, I dremel them so often. So there's no tip to trim off. If you were starting fresh or um, just starting, you know, like a puppy, you would go ahead and, and trim them. Or if I was doing a dog's nails that were so long, I would trim them first, then go to the dremel um, to file them. And the dremel, you get them smooth and round. And so when I, when I do her nail, I, I hold each toe individually because I don't want that toe rocking in her foot. I want to hold each toe very gently again. And then I do side, side, top. You don't want to go on the underside. And the reason for that is that's where the quick is, huh? And um, so you want, <laughs> she's, she puts her paws on my face to make me stop talking. <laughs> um, okay. So you can buy, a, I mean, there's a lot of pet Dremels out there, but you can buy, a, you know, or use your husband's Dremel or, or whatever, you know, um, you have these. I like the ones that are adjustable and you'll see when I turn it on, it's going to be a little bit noisy, but um, it's adjustable. So if I had a big St. Bernard or Great Dane, I could really turn up that power to get through that. But she's little, so I just keep it on one. And what I do for a dog that's nervous or you're just teaching him is hold it away and we're going to have fun, right? And she's, and let her hear the noise first. Please. She's like, woo. <laughs> and then I'm going to grab your toes and we're going to give you cookies on your dog. Kiss, 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 kiss. So I've got her toe in my hand. I've got her secure. I'm just going to do one toe at a time. Okay, good girl. Side, side, top. She had bloody feet when I got her because she was living on a cage and her feet were raw and a mess. And for her to even allow me to touch it and just, I did one foot at a time and I just treated, 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 treated. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges. I know so many people that have to put their pets, um, have to sedate them to do nails or they don't do them often enough. Oh, that's the other big thing. I know I'm going over, I'm so sorry. Um, this is my favorite topic, <laughs> but like Buka, um, he's old and, you know, like Edgar, Edgar's old and Edgar has arthritis and, um, and if their nails start to turn, they start throwing their neck and their back out. So keeping their nails as short as possible is, is, is really helpful even for their, their, um, physical structure. The other thing is they don't slip. I mean, as geriatrics, like as Buka gets older, we have all tile in this house and hardwood floors. And so um, I keep the pads of his feet shaved so he has more traction. And then I keep him, uh, I keep his nails super, super short. 
Because when you're hearing that clicking and sliding, that risks him tearing an ACL or throwing his back out or throwing his neck out. Okay, you can go. Goodbye. So that's my, those are my, my top tip, home grooming tips that I think anybody can do at home. Um, you know, take time and, um, and we'll help your dog. So any questions? <laughs> Uh, I have a step-by-step -step video on nails and putting toe grips on. Oh, great. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so toe for older dogs, you know, especially if you have an older guy, like I said, keeping the nails trimmed back, super important. Keeping the pads of those feet shaped, super important. The toe grips that Nancy's talking about is you put toe grips over the nail, they're rubber grips, and they help them get traction. So as a dog ages and starts to knuckle and they, they can't really lift that foot up, um, putting those toe grips on is great. Another suggestion for an older dog, um, if you're getting to that point is, and our house kind of looks like this now, is that we have those um, runners, rubber back runners throughout the house so that he doesn't slip on the hardwood floors. Um, I, the home on the Cape, um, I always make sure on the deck, I have all these crazy rubber mats so that he doesn't slip on the ice. Um, but uh, I think that's, that's pretty much it. There, there is a product called, um, what's it called? It's like slip away or something. And it's a spray. You can spray on the bottoms of their feet that gives them a little bit more traction. Um, that that's helpful too. That's it. So Sherry uh, has been, Sherry, you wanna share what you're doing grooming wise with, with uh, Samson? Oh. Sherry's got a major like grooming. He's got this black skin that she actually has to shampoo and scrape the skin off to open up the pores. Yeah. Um so the shampoo is every three days. And then I have a spray that I, um, um, I actually I've been using the um, rejuvenating skin spray mm -hmm. um, on him. And he had a bath yesterday and I didn't find anything to scrape off. Awesome. Which means yeah. I think we're close to having, uh, you know, fresh skin start to, to come forward. Oh. Um, nice. but I'll tell you several of the things that you talked about, um, are going to be really helpful. And, and okay. I, I didn't know, um, I'm excited about the dry brush idea. I think that will be really helpful for his, um, skin and his hair growth. And yep. I'm wondering, like with the, the dry brush that we, um, use on ourselves, mm -hmm. could I put the oils on the brush? Yep. Yep. That's what I did with Buka. He had many bald spots when we got him um, and had no hair. And, and so I, you can put it on the brush or I lube him up first. You know, mm -hmm. I put it, what I did is, and he doesn't have a lot of hair, so he could get it on his skin. And I'd, I'd rub it all in first and then I dry brush him and really stimulate that hair. Okay. Yeah. And he, you know, we had lots of spots that he didn't have hair. The only two places he doesn't have hair now is on his hocks, which I don't think it'll ever grow because it was, he was chained up and it was, it's scar oh, yeah. tissue. It's just yeah. scar tissue. Yeah. But um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, that'll be good. Know, absolutely. Because like he can't stimulate his lymphatic system with vigorous exercise because um, Samson has two torn ACLs and hip dysplasia. So he can't do vigorous exercise. So you're going to actually have right. to manually do it and do the aroma touch massage to super helpful for stimulating yeah. blood flow. I would definitely use rosemary with him for sure. Oh, okay. Um, That's a good idea. Yeah. The rosemary yeah. to stimulate that hair growth. For the hair growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's really helpful. Yeah. That's a good idea. I Thank you. Was, this has been great. Awesome. Yes. So um, Edgar, who's 13, the one that I just got, super, super like this, 
really bad. Does not, I tried to do him and try to do him when he was sleeping. Doesn't like his nails. Not having it. So tomorrow when I go to the vet, I was just going to have them do it for the first time to yes. get them started. And then how would you yeah. recommend I go forward with it? Should I? So um, doing them for the first, I definitely would recommend that. And, um, and I would really, you know, I know they know what they're doing, but sometimes they'll just like quick, quickly have the technician do it. Really stress that they're close to the pad and you're, you really want to add, even if ask if they can file that, that underneath so it's off the pad. That way, when you get home, I even, so um, Bella has that type of feet too, like, like a Frenchie, you know, where the nails just will curl around if I let them get a little too long. And I took a regular nail file and I file the underneath of hers very gently and I treat her and I, um, and then, then moving forward, like even once a week, if you could, and you could get some of those pet dremels that are a little quieter on the internet since he doesn't like it just once a week lightly do it and you know you might only be able to do one toenail you may get you know yeah. you might be able to yeah. put, put that emotional blend on and do because you don't want to stress them out they're already you know a little bit um nervous um do one toenail just make it super positive and just you know, do a toenail every day and switch. That's how I started with Buka. He wouldn't let okay. me touch his feet. He was bad. And, and he is like Eeyore, you know, and Pooh Bear combined. He is the sweetest, most loving dog. But when I touched his feet, he went, rah! <laughs> and I was like, whoo, who are you? <laughs> I, I, you know, I was afraid he's big. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I just did it and I did it lightly with a, a human nail file. Um, okay. especially on that underneath, cause you don't want that. That's really, really hard once it starts to go under. Um, yeah, so you can use the human fit nail file on the underneath to keep it up off the pad. And then, um, a Dremel, I wouldn't recommend cutting a dog's like that because he's dark and you're not going to see it. I would, I would go with a really quiet Dremel and just Dremel the top. Um, okay. and just, and just keep at it. Okay, great. Thank eventually you. Eventually he'll get yeah, eventually he'll get used to it and especially you know, cuz you guys are home, you're quiet and it's it's you know, you can make it it fun for him and and it's okay. spending time with him. Um they okay. eventually like it just takes time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Cool beans, guys. Well, thanks for joining. What what's next week? Sherry's better at that. What am I doing next week? I think it's, I think it's kidney urinary. I think it's kidney urinary and bladder health. I haven't looked, um, yeah. but, but I'll get on it as soon as we're no, done here. <laughs> I know you're so good. I think that's what we're doing next week. And then, um, uh, and then I think the last week is a deep dive into nutrition, which we've talked a lot about, but um, I just really want to like really break it down. And then the, the big one on March 1st is the allergies. Yes. And allergies. we got to go back to allergies because I have internet now. <laughs> <laughs> Those damn landscapers are back again, though. They were fixing the irrigation heads today. I was like, no, no. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, I will send this out to you all and um, I'll send you some links too. And uh, I will see you all next Tuesday. Bye.